Our church exists to help people to find God, experience freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. If you have any questions about Journey Church, please visit us at ourjourney.tv. Welcome home. Welcome to Journey Church. I want to say welcome to Journey Church. We are in a series called The Hall of Faith. And I have been inviting several of my friends to come on Sunday mornings and deliver God's word to you. These are men of God that I trust, that I've gotten to know over the years. And this morning, I want to introduce to you Pastor of Second Baptist. Now, Pastor David and I, we have been acquaintances for many years through our homeschool events and community outreaches. And I would say over the years, we have... tolerated each other (laughs) because we did not know each other very well. And while we enjoyed each other and got to respect each other for sure, one of the things over the last three to four years that I have particularly enjoyed about getting to know Pastor David Tucker is his unique insights to God's Word, his wise counsel over the years to my life. And so it's not just me introducing you to a fellow pastor in our community, but I have the opportunity this morning to introduce you to what I would call a great friend. And so would you give a wonderful Journey Church welcome to my good friend, pastor of Second Baptist, Pastor David Tucker. Good morning to you. I am excited to be with you. And Vince is right. We have gotten to know each other well these last several years, and it has been such a blessing. And I've gotten to know many of you, uh, whether it's through Trace Diaz and the weekend there, or whether it's through the events we've done as a joint church, uh, or kingdom, I should say. And, And as I've done so, I've just become just really enamored with what you do and the way you do it. I think it's phenomenal. I'm excited by it. And I will say that I think Pastor Vince has a lot of vision that that most pastors don't have. And I mean that in the most complimentary possible way because he sees things that others don't. I have learned a lot. Now, I'm, I'm a little bit older than Vince, and so I'm a little more set in my ways. But having, getting to know him has is, is helped me, it's pushed me to learn some things. Now, Vince, I'm still not on TikTok and will not be. But <laughs> I have learned that there is a use to that. If you can take something and use it to the ministry, it is a blessing. But one of the things that I've loved most about getting to know Pastor Vince and, and also uh, Pastor Will and, and on down the line, I have enjoyed gathering around individuals who support me in the kingdom work. Having other pastors who you can talk with and share with, it's encouraging to you and helpful to you. When you're in your own church, your own silo, as it were, there's a loneliness that sets in. And we're going to talk about that today. That it doesn't matter how strong you think you are spiritually, if you are siloed, in other words, alone, then you are ripe for the devil to take control. And so what we want to talk about is... A man who was literally a superhero, okay? Now, when, when I start talking about this guy, you're going to think, well, he's in that chapter 11, right? That, that chapter 11, that, that hall of faith. And I've enjoyed, by the way, listening to your sermons. Uh, Pastor Vince's sermon on Samson was phenomenal. I loved listening to Pastor uh, Todd as he was preaching on Abraham. I liked his accent. made me feel like I was back home, all right? It was fantastic. And one of the things I loved in listening to them teach on both of those characters was that they showed the humanity of who they were. A lot of times when we look in the hall of faith, Hebrews 11, and we start to say, man, I couldn't be him. I couldn't do what she did. There's no way that I can do what they have done. And the truth is, Hebrews 11 is there to inspire you to think, yes, you could. The whole goal of Hebrews 11 is to actually inspire us to live the life of faith that others have lived before us. But today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a real superhero, but I don't want to talk to you about the superhero. Here's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about sidekicks, all right? Now, if I was to ask you 
to name for me maybe five sidekicks right now. Who could you name? Famous sidekicks. Let me throw out one. Barney Fife. Done. All right? Who, who's another sidekick? Say it again. Robin. Boy Wonder. All right? Before Boy Wonder, there was Alfred, right? The butler. He was a sidekick. All right? Who else we got? Tonto. Excellent. Lone Ranger has Tonto. Absolutely. Brother, John Wick has a dog, right? So when we think about sidekicks, it's hard for us to remember. I actually went on the web and I, I, I Googled, you know, top sidekicks. There was a list of 50, and I had no idea that I remembered so many of them until I started going through the list. You know, Chewbacca, he was a sidekick. He was a huge sidekick, but he was a sidekick. Listen, we're going to be talking about a guy named Elijah. And you know Elijah's name, but you do not know the name of his sidekicks. And so what I want you to learn today is all of his sidekicks, all three of them. And I want you to learn of the difference that they made in his life. Now, the first thing I have to do, because we do everything based on Scripture, is I have to tell you that what I'm preaching from, chapter 11 in Hebrews, is only the starting point of my passage, because Elijah is actually not even mentioned in the passage, okay? If you will, turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 11, and I want you to jump in there at verse 32. There, the writer says, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel, and the prophets. That's a plural. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Now, as you're going through there, you saw the term prophets, but you didn't hear the prophet, Elijah. And as you were going through there, you might have, if you know some of the scripture, you might have identified some of those prophets he was talking about. Who, who shut the mouths of the lions? Daniel, excellent, wonderful, wonderful job. Who did not bend, did not break, and did not burn? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, very good, okay. But here's my question. Who was the first individual to raise the dead in Scripture? Elijah. Elijah is a prophet's prophet. You don't even have to say his name. His renown is understood all the way through the New Testament. Now, we'll go through quickly some of the things that he did, okay? We can start with the fact that he raised the dead. We can also talk about the fact that he was able to see flour and oil continue in plenty with a woman who had nothing, right? We can also say that he had his most famous battle where? Mount Carmel against who? Prophets of Baal. 450 guys against one. And now, I've, I've done two on one. I've done three on one in basketball. I've never done 450 against one, Okay. But Elijah was able to literally bring a kingdom and a nation to its knees through his spiritual life of prayer. That is who Elijah was. How powerful is his image? How powerful is his reputation? Well, the truth is it carries all the way into the New Testament thousands of years later. The prophecy of Jesus coming is given a forerunner, and the forerunner is considered Elijah. John the Baptist was Elijah coming forth again. Not only that, but at the end of all time, when Jesus is getting ready to come back, there's going to be two witnesses in Jerusalem, we are told, and the theologians believe that one witness is Moses and the other is Elijah. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus wanted to talk with two people from heaven, he spoke with Moses and Elijah. Here is why. Moses represents all of the law. Elijah represents all of the prophecy. 
He is the symbol of God's promise always being fulfilled. He is the symbol of if God said it, it's gonna happen. He's one life. His one reputation encompasses all of that. Now I wanna ask you, what would your reputation encompass? What would your name carry in years to come? Would it encompass the understanding that if God said it, he will do it. Elijah, his life and his amazing release from life carried with it that reputation. How important was Elijah to God? He is the only individual that we know of that God called an Uber to go pick up. Elijah's walking along, God sweeps down, picks him up, and Elisha says, I see. And he is carried away into heaven. There are two men in the Old Testament who do not die. One is Enoch and one is Elijah. If you have a child and you want to name him with an E, it's a good start, okay? His reputation is powerful. His example is one of faith. And it's also one of strength. You want somebody to stand up to a king, he can do it. You want somebody to take on a nation, he can do it. You want somebody to change weather patterns, he can do that. If you will, I want you to turn with me over to 1 Kings there in chapter 17. We're going to find his story in, verse, in chapters 17, 18, and 19. I want to encourage you to read all three chapters after we're released because I always want you to know that what I'm saying is what the Bible says you don't need to know what I think. You need to know what God has promised. So I encourage you, although I will not read all three of those chapters, you need to read them so that you will know, okay? So we are introduced to Elijah in this simple passage. Uh, chapter 17, 1 Kings, he says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, that's the king, as the Lord God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain the next few years except at my word. That's Elijah. Bold, brash, strong. He is a superhero. He might as well have stood up to Ahab with a cape on, right? And said, listen, you're not going to see a drop of rain come through here until I tell you it comes. It's all going to dry up. Now, this is the first piece of the puzzle. Elijah is prophet man. But when he operates completely alone, he is just a man. The first thing that God does is he goes to protect Elijah by sending him to some sidekicks. Okay? They're called the ravens. It's not the football team. It's literal ravens. If you will, I want you to look there in verse two. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook. I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. And so he did what the Lord told him. And he went to Kirith Ravine in the Jordan and stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. The first thing that God does after he has confronted Ahab and said there's not going to be any rain is he gets Elijah out of Dodge because he is now a wanted man. He is a fugitive, okay? As a matter of fact, we find out later on in chapter 18 that the king has gone to every nation that is around him and said, have you seen him? Bring him to me. And he doesn't believe anybody who tells him, hey, we haven't seen him, okay? He wants Elijah, and he wants Elijah dead. But God has hidden him away in the ravine. But here's what I want you to take note of. This is important. He is not alone. You say, well, Brother Dave, he is. He's, he's eating from ravens. He's not having company over. He is alone. No, he's not. The ravens are not just sustenance. They are emotional companions. You say, oh, now come on. That's not true. Yeah, it is. 
First off, it says God directed them. In the King James, it says God commanded them. These are birds that are taking orders from God. So they are a direct physical connection between him and the Father who is leading him. Does that make sense? Second is how many of you guys have kids or grandkids here and have found a stray dog or cat in your yard? Anybody raise your hand? Nobody? Y'all get rid of them before they find them, don't you? All right. Oh, there's one. How long was it until the child had a name for the animal? Five minutes. There it is. Mr. Whiskers thirsty, right? He, he's got the mange, child. We can't have it. I am telling you, Elijah had nothing to do except to sit and wait for ravens to come and feed him in the morning and ravens to come back and feed him at night. Do you not think that he started to figure out which ravens were which? Do you not believe that he didn't start naming those ravens? Oh, that's Clyde. He always brings the biggest pieces of meat. He saw their personalities. He understood their communication with one another. He started to study them and he was able by just simply seeing them, the power of God in his life. You say, Brother David, that's, that's just a bunch of malarkey. It's funny, but it's not real. In nursing homes today, they have what are called service dogs, service pets. I have a friend of mine, he just moved out of a nursing home. He's in a, in a group home now, and I got him out of there on Friday. In that nursing home, if you go in, you will always meet Max. Max is a yellow Labrador. He is fed by the people in the nursing home. Max is about 350 pounds. But Max is essential to the treatment of people with dementia, okay? With people who are cut off from family or friends. When Max walks in, you watch their eyes light up. Why? Because there's something about the physical touch of a living being that reminds you there is a God who loves you and he is with you. So many of us assume Elijah is strong enough to be on his own. God never left him alone. God provided his sidekicks, the ravens. Now eventually, the ravens who were bringing food need to be replaced by another sidekick who is going to provide him family. I want you, if you will, to go in chapter 17 to the next couple of verses. Starting there in verse 7, read with me. He says, Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. When the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow to supply you with food. For, um, so he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, the widow was there gathering sticks and he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As he was going to get it, he called, and bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I do not have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and to make a meal for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first, man, he's bold, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. And the scripture says, that she went away and she did what Elijah requested. And so from that point on, God provides for Elijah through the widow. She feeds him, she gets him drink, and she provides, listen carefully, a home. The ravens, they could provide food, but the widow... She can provide family. You say, well, Brother David, it, it doesn't say that they got married. It doesn't say they even went and started dating. I understand that. 
but they were a unit together. They were weathering a famine side by side. They became family. You say, well, they weren't related. They weren't connected. They weren't, but they became family. I I love what Pastor Vince has been saying through this service. You know, if you're here once, you're a visitor. If you're here a second time, you're family. We become family with those who we connect to, especially, listen carefully, in the crisis of our lives. So here is Elijah, and he is connecting and and reviving his spirit, not simply through the food that's being offered, but also through the family connection that's been given. How strong is this family connection? Well, actually, remember I told you he raises the dead, right? It'll be the son of that widow that is raised from the dead. I want you to take a look at the passage with me, okay? If you will, jump down there to verse 15. It says, she went away and did, oh, I'm sorry, I gotta jump a little further. Sometime later, verse 17, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. And he said to, uh, she said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and to kill my son? Give, your, uh, give me your son, Elijah replied. And he took, her from his, uh, took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on the bed. And then listen, listen, listen as, he, as this verse is read. And then he cried out, To the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? And then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. And Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house and he gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Elijah wasn't simply raising the son. He wasn't simply performing a miracle. Did you hear the passion of the words? Elijah cries out. What's the first thing he cried out? Lord, why? Why would you do this to her? Why would you do this to him? Could it be, just asking, that he's grown attached? That he's connected? That he has begun to emotionally bond with these people and to love? And God uses this moment to solidify that truth in his life. How hard did that truth go down? Well, I'm gonna share with you a theory, and it's a Pastor Dave theory, so don't put a lot of stock in it. But there's a final sidekick who never receives a name. He's called a servant. It is my theory that that servant is her son. The scripture says, that these three weathered the storm of the famine and the drought until it was time for him to face the prophets of Baal. Everyone knows in Elijah's life, this is the culmination. This is the Super Bowl. This is where Superman has to step out and save the world, right? This is where Batman sees the signal up in the sky. And Elijah steps forth and he goes and hunts down Ahab, who's been hunting for him. And he hunts him down to settle things once and for all. So I got a question for you. Would Elijah have ever met Ahab if he had not met the widow? Would Elijah have ever met Ahab if he hadn't met Clyde the raven? Would Elijah have ever made it to face the prophets if there weren't other faces who showed up to support him. There is no Elijah if there is no sidekick. Let me prove the point. 
If you will, I want you to jump across over to ex, uh, Exodus, 1 Kings chapter 19. There in verse 1, it says this. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. We're going to stop there for a minute and absorb something here. Very quickly, take note. The world does not want Elijah's. The world does not want super people of faith. Satan does not desire Elijah's. Anyone here who chooses to follow God and go against the grain, understand you are looking to reap the whirlwind from Satan and the world. What Jezebel says in the King James is that I will kill you like you killed them. In the NIV, it says I will make you like them. The goal of the world and the goal of Satan is to take every believer who stands out and to make them conform to those who don't. God desires for us to go against the grain. He wants us to be different. He wants us to make a difference. But Satan doesn't desire that. What he wants is for me to get in line with everybody else. And so the world has a current and it's running. For me to fight that current takes God's strength and sidekicks. It takes God's strength for me to stand out. It takes God's strength for me to stand up. But it takes others to assist me. When I was up in New England, I used to do some whitewater canoeing. In whitewater canoeing, you jump and put your boat into a, a river that's moving very fast one direction. And you don't get to put brakes on. There are not a lot of brakes on a canoe, okay? You can backpedal as fast as you want, but if it's a really good whitewater, it's moving you. Do you know what you do to stop and figure out where you're at and what's coming next? You look for a rock. I know what you're thinking. That doesn't sound safe. No, you don't aim to hit the rock. You aim to get behind the rock. The rock is in the middle of the stream. And what happens is when the current flows so strongly around that rock, it creates an eddy that swirls up behind it. And I have been in a canoe with water rushing on either side while the canoe sat still, held to the rock by the eddy of the water that was made. Folks, Journey Church is your rock. It is not the world's current that holds you. It's the rock that holds in the current that holds you in place. When you come here, you get that strength. When you come here, you get that chance to see downstream. When you come here, you get the opportunity to have truth overtake some of the lies that the devil continues to play. We are here every Sunday. We are here Every time the doors are open. Not because we want to be super Christians. We are here because we aren't. And we need the rock to hold us. The rock is the truth of God. And the church is built on the rock. So here is Elijah. He's been told, I'm going to make your life like theirs. Listen to what he does. Elijah was afraid, verse 3, ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he was himself, while he himself went away a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush. He sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the brush and fell asleep. There are two things that are stated in chapter 19. One, Elijah says, I want to die. God says twice, Elijah, why are you here? 
He says it twice in that chapter. Elijah, how did you come to this place? How did you arrive at this location? How did you come to this state? I can show you how he got there. Go back again and listen to the words. It says in verse 3, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he what? Left his servant. He had somebody that was with him. He had somebody that was going to go with him. I think he had a son that had been raised from the dead to be with him. But in his fear, he shut himself off and he got alone. And when you and I get alone and afraid, bad things come. When you and I get alone and afraid, dark thoughts drift in. When you and I don't lean on the supports that God has given us. 2 things will happen. We're going to go downhill. And God's going to ask us, "But why are you here?" For you see, I have given you comfort. I have given you a presence. I have given you those around you to support you. Maybe you're here today and you're going through a time of darkness. I want you to understand, you may feel like you don't want to share it with anybody and you may feel like you don't want to lean on anybody and you may think that nobody needs to hear this trouble. I'll handle this myself. I will take care of it alone. No. Maybe you're here today and you've got a sin in your life and you know that sin's been eating you up on the inside but you don't want to share it with anybody. You don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to handle it with somebody. You say, I'll just take care of this alone. My friend, you're in the midst of a support system a family, love. With that family, Elijah can face 450 prophets of Baal. Without that family, even Elijah falls. I want to encourage you today. If you came in here alone, don't leave alone. There is a Jesus who loves you and his presence will be walking with you. There is a church that is around you and their support can help sustain you. There is a family of God who wants to serve you. You can make the decision to receive them. One last thing. I want to encourage you today, if you're feeling good in your walk with God, don't strive to be an Elijah. Strive to be a sidekick. Find somebody you can support. And in that, let me say this. You as a church, bless Miss Laura like crazy. She is a sidekick to this man. She is a support to this man. And maybe you don't understand what it means to be a pastor's wife, but it's like a cut man in a corner, Will. You can't fight the fight for him, but you have to mend up the wounds when he comes back to the corner. She's patching him up and sending him back. And if she falls, he's going down. Don't ever forget the blessing you have in the wives who support the ministers of this church. They are the sidekicks who are unsung heroes within this family of faith. Pastor Vince. Thank you for being with us online. Our desire is to journey with you however you want to connect with us. We look forward to doing life with you. Now let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. We'll see you here next week.